So the sermon tonight is going to be about Naboth the Jezreelite. So I find this story about Naboth the Jezreelite really interesting. There's just so many things to it. And, you know, maybe you've, you've heard this story before. You know, maybe you haven't caught everything that's going on in this story. But it's just a really interesting story, how things work out. You know, you get some insight into what happens in heaven in this story as well. But I'm try, I'll try and go through it as quickly as possible. There's actually three chapters I want to go through in the Bible. So I want to kind of just breeze through it and go through the story um, if you're not familiar with it. I, f I find it really interesting, like I said, these stories in the Old Testament. And hopefully, again, it encourages you guys to get into your Bible, reading it, realizing that a lot of these stories that you may think, oh, you know, this is hard reading through just because you're not familiar with it. When you actually see what the story is about, it's actually really interesting reading through First, Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. Um, even in Genesis as well, there's a lot of interesting stories. In Exodus, there's interesting stories. Numbers as well. You know, the, the stories of the children of Israel going through the wilderness and all the things that happen there. And as you learn about these stories and, and they're referenced in the New Testament, as we saw in the book of Jude, these things will now make sense to you. You understand why they're using that story as an example. Now, just from a show of hands, who, who, who knows, before I go through this sermon, who knows who Naboth the Jezreelite is? I know Lewis already knew. Yeah, you heard Naboth the Jezreelite. So this is good. So sometimes I think, hey, you know, because if you, if you read through the Bible, you kind of like learn these stories. But, you know, maybe not everyone's so familiar with the name. Maybe when you hear the story, you'll be more familiar with the story. But maybe you just don't know the guy by name. Like another guy I always like to talk about is Bezalel, right? People don't know him, but people at this church have probably heard of him because I've preached on him a few times. And he was the guy that, that built all the things for the tabernacle, right? And, you know, to me, it's, he's, he's a really good example of, of God giving him talent to use for God. So I'll try and go through this story and then we'll have some applications at the end on what we can learn from the story of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Now, Naboth the Jezreelite, his story starts in 1 Kings 21. So as we read through this, I'll explain to you what's going on. Now, Naboth the Jezreelite, he lived, the reason why he's called the Jezreelite is because he's from Jezreel, right? That's why Israelite, you know, Canaanite, yeah, that's how, that's the Andersonite, <laughs> yeah, that's why people joke, like, you know, when they say you're following somebody, right? That's why they add the ite on the end. Because that's how the Bible does it, right? If you're from that land, then you're called Canaanite. You know, we'd say Australian, but back then maybe it's Australia, right? Or something, I don't know. So that's, that's where the Jezreelite come from. And that's why people make fun of that when people follow people too closely. You know, I hope, I hope Tayite never becomes something because you guys will have the sense, you know, not just to, you know, you know, digest everything I tell you and regurgitate it, but have a mind of your own and base everything that you believe on the Bible so you never sort of get that reputation. But in 1 Kings 21, this is where the story starts, right, with Naboth the Jezreelite. It came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard. And this is how people know, what know about Naboth because his vineyard was very famous because of what happened to his vineyard in this story and the strife that's, that surrounded it. He had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So who is Ahab? He's the king of Israel at the time, right? So there you have Israel and you have Judah. Uh, Judah was, you know, if you remember the split after uh, uh, King Solomon, Rehoboam uh, took the, the kingdom of Judah and Rehoboam the kingdom of Israel. So Ahab descends into the kingdom of Israel and the capital city of Israel, if you remember, is Samaria. So he's living in Samaria and Naboth, the Jezreelite, Jezreel is near Samaria and he's saying it's hard by the palace of King Ahab because where Naboth lived and his vineyard was very close to where Ahab lived in the palace. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs. So what is he saying? He wants to buy Naboth's vineyard, right, so he can have a garden, right, and plant uh, things to, to eat. Because it is near, so we would think garden of herbs, right? Just like rosemary and things like that. But when they talk about garden of herbs, it's just, you know, vegetables to eat. Because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee, I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. So he's saying to him, I want to buy your vineyard so I can have a garden, you know, because it's near to my house. He likes it, you know. And he's saying, hey, I'm either going to I can give you a better vineyard or I can pay for it with money. Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. 
Now, one thing, obviously, physically, Naboth is declining the offer, right? He's saying, no, no, I'm not going to give my parcel of land that I inherited. If you remember when they went into the land of Canaan and they inherited land, you know, it was divided up into the different tribes and they inherited from their fathers. This is what Naboth is saying. This is the land when they went into the land of Israel, right, in the land of Canaan and inherited their land. It was divided up by God. And he's saying, hey, I'm not going to sell what I inherited from God. Now, we can learn something spiritual from this as well, in the sense that we, have, we ought to have this attitude with the spiritual things we inherit from God. What is that? The, the, the principles, the doctrine, the word of God, right? And what is Naboth saying here? He's saying, what I inherited from my father, what I inherited down, passed down from God, is more valuable to me than your money, right? And we ought to think about that spiritually as well. It's like, hey, the truth, the word of God, Taking a stand for Jesus Christ is more important than money. But how often do people sell out, right? You, don't, you want to get that promotion, so you don't want people to know you're a Christian. You want to be successful in this or successful in that, and you're worried about the persecution. I mean, it's coming here to our country now, right? You know, people want to take a stand against marriage, you know, they're in that sort of business, you know, whatever. But, you know, as Christians, we ought to have the attitude of Naboth, right? And say, no, 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 it's more important to me that I hold on to what I've got from God than money. And Ahab came into his house, heavy and displeased. So we see here just the, the, the immature nature of Ahab, right? He acts like a little child when you say, a child, no, and they just whine. Came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give the inheritance of my fathers. Look at this. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. This is the king of Israel, right? Remember the Bible says, you know, like, woe unto the people when, you know, like, when women rule over to them and children are their rulers. This is, this, this is Ahab, right? This is a wicked nation of Israel, Ahab, and he's behaving like a child, right? He, he gets upset. Somebody says no to him, and he goes home. You know, he's on his bed. He's having a little tanty, right? And, and he doesn't even want to eat. So now his wife comes to him. So not only is he childish, he married a wicked woman. We know Jezebel, this wicked woman that killed so many of God's people. And here she's going to do it again in 1 Kings 21. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? Now Lewis and I were just talking uh, briefly today about the difference between spirit and soul. Um, but I think it's interesting here that I, I often see like spirit is, is likened to like your attitude, right? Your demeanor. Things like that. Why is thy spirit so sad? So something to do with your words and the, 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 the attitude that you have is that the things that you say is, is linked into your spirit. That thou eatest no bread. So she's saying, you know, what, why are you so sad? Uh, why aren't you eating? And he said unto her, because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite and said unto him, give me thy vineyard for money or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. So he's obviously going over uh, what just happened between him and Naboth. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Now, the way I understand what she's saying here is basically, like, aren't you the king of Israel? And she's like saying, what, what, who, who has the right to say no to you? You know, you're the king of Israel, right? Arise and eat. So she's saying, hey, eat, have something to eat. Cheer yourself up. Let thine heart be merry. And I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So now she's making plans to get that vineyard for her husband, Ahab. So look at what she does, this wicked woman. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, proclaim a fast. Now I've underlined this because... It's just interesting that, you know, the way Jezebel operates, right? She's like, she's like pulling the strings in the background. Satan's often the same, isn't he? He's like pulling the strings in the background and he's sort of like doing things in people's names that we see today. Like that you think they're operating, but there are darker forces happening in this world in the background. But look, when, when, when Satan and evil people are out to do something wicked, they always do it in, in good intentions, right? 
proclaim a fast they try and make it all spiritual like oh you know you know like we're trying to make it all religious now what they're about to do to dress it up as something good rather than something that is wicked why right? to get people in the public on board i mean you never see things that are wicked done in this world done you know the, the truth is never told they're never going to tell you that abortion is murder you know that you're murdering an unborn child i like all the jokes that are coming out now just to show the the double standards of people that believe these things where they say oh you know yeah they, they want they, they're upset when you know a, a lady gets gets in a car accident and it should be like a double homicide but you know and then they're, and, they're, and they're saying hey why isn't there any punishment for the person that crashed into the car and and the baby in the womb died as well there's not any extra punishment but at the same time if a woman if she didn't die if they didn't die in the car crash and she just goes to the doctor and gets an abortion then there's no charges at all it's like what's, what's the double standard here so but what do they dress it up as you know when they want to kill babies right they don't just say hey we're going to kill babies and harvest their organs you know and sell them like uh like planned parenthood does no they say no it's about woman's choice it's about a woman's rights you know if you deny her from killing her own baby you're denying you know her right to, to her freedom to be a woman you know so it's the same here they're always dressing it up nicely right so here she's plotting to kill naboth proclaim a fast set naboth on high among the people so i guess they're bringing him to to the capital right where the judgment would be made look at this and set two men sons of belial so she knows the sort of people that are willing to do the dirty work right sons of belial these are the reprobates right these are people that hate god want nothing to do with god and they're the enemies of god sons of belial before him to bear witness against him saying thou didst blaspheme god and the king so these sons of belial have no conscience whatsoever they're willing at at the command of jezebel to basically falsely accuse a man of something he didn't do so that he can be stoned publicly uh, thou didst blaspheme god and the king and then carry him out and stone him that he may die and jezebel oh sorry i went back uh, and the men of his city even the elders and the nobles this is what i find so sad about naboth's example here his story here that there wasn't even one elder or noble in his city that was willing to take a stand to say no i'm not going to falsely accuse this man and why is that remember we talked about people selling out for money oftentimes because you know jezebel was in control i'm sure ahab and jezebel have a lot of riches have a lot of power that they can offer and these people were not willing to make the stand every elder and noble in that city right were willing to sell themselves out to sell themselves out to work evil right to have naboth stoned innocently at the command of this wicked woman jezebel who were the inhabitants in his city did as jezebel had sent unto them and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them they proclaimed a fast and set naboth on high among the people and there came in two men children of belial so these were the two sons of belial that I talked about before and sat before him and the men of belial witnessed against him even against naboth in the presence of the people saying naboth did blaspheme god and the king then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died then they sent to jezebel saying naboth is stoned and is dead right so we don't even know who naboth was before this right it's not like naboth isn't anybody here he's just a guy that owned a parcel of land that was willing not willing to give it to the king for any sort of money he wanted to hold stay you want to stand his ground right and because he stood his ground he was killed for it um so they they carry out what jezebel says and then they send back saying hey what you've asked us to do has been done came to pass when jezebel heard that naboth was stoned and was dead that jezebel said to ahab arise take possession of the vineyard of naboth the jezreelite which he refused to give thee for money for naboth is not alive but dead and it came to pass when ahab heard that naboth was dead that ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of naboth the jezreelite to take possession of it so if you understand what's happening now that he's dead jezebel says to ahab hey he's dead now now you can go take the vineyard that you wanted now this is when elijah comes to confront ahab right for allowing him for allowing what just happened to happen right 
So they think everything's done in secret, right? This conspiracy to kill Na Na Naboth, but no, the Lord saw everything, right? And he sends Elijah to go talk to Ahab. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, look at this, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. So isn't that interesting? And God's seeing all this happen, right? And as he sees this all happen, Jezebel comes back and says, hey, Naboth is dead now. Go and claim the vineyard. Then when he goes down to claim it, at the same time, Elijah comes to meet him, right? Because Elijah knows he's in the vineyard to, to possess the vineyard of Naboth. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, look at this, thus saith the Lord. Look at what Elijah says. Has thou killed and also taken possession? Isn't that interesting that Ahab is held accountable for what his wife did, right? Because it was his wife's plan to kill, uh, to kill Naboth and for the sons of Belial to, to, to falsely accuse him. But because Ahab allowed it to happen as the man of the house, like the Bible teaches, God actually held him accountable and said, hey, you've allowed it to happen. You let your wife sign those letters in your name. And he's saying to him, hey, has thou, remember, because thou is different to you, right? Thou is singular. He's saying, has thou killed and also taken possession and thou shalt speak unto him saying thus saith the lord so similar to the story of david right where david sort of thought he got away with something right and then a prophet came to him and said no you're going to get punished for it it's the same here elijah is coming to ahab and saying hey in the place where dogs licked the blood of naboth shall dogs lick thy blood even thine so he's saying hey because you've killed you've taken possession where you killed Naboth, because he's somewhere in Samaria, right? Wherever the courts take place and they stone him. He's saying, hey, where the dogs licked the blood of Naboth, he's saying, so will the dogs lick your blood, right? And Ahab said to Elijah, hast thou found me, O mine enemy? Because if you remember in 1 Kings 18, when we talked about before, you know, um, you know, Elijah and Ahab, obviously are not on good terms because Elijah is always preaching against Ahab. And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. So we already talked about this a bit, and that's why it's interesting that the Bible uses that phraseology to say, hey, Ahab sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Why is it saying sold thyself? Because he allowed Jezebel to kill Naboth, who was innocent because he wanted a possession. Right? And like us, we ought not to, to do evil, especially, or to sell out just for money, right? Because doing what is right is more important than material possessions. He sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. He says, Behold, I will bring evil upon thee. So this is Ahab's judgment, right? I'll bring evil upon thee. And will take away thy posterity and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall so this is a phrase that the bible uses to describe men right because men stand up and they and they pee right it says from ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in israel so what is he saying here to ahab he's saying not only are, are the dogs going to lick your blood where the blood of naboth was licked but also he's saying he's gonna god's gonna basically wipe out your family right because of the evil that you have done and it's not only this act Right? Ahab is obviously a wicked king that has made Israel, they're worshipping Baal. I remember we read in Jeremiah, he's saying God's going to destroy those houses and people are like, oh, like, oh my God's so mean destroying all these houses. No, because they were using those houses to worship Baal. Right? They were worshipping Baal on top of their houses and they were offering their children in the fire to Molech. Right? So we, we don't get the full picture. You don't want to learn the Bible just from TV, right? This TV, they talk about the God of the Old Testament, like he's this really bad God and he's just really mean all the time. But what they, what they failed to tell you is how wicked Israel was, how wicked Judah was, and all the evil that they were doing and all the this, all this sin. And God, has he, he's trying to reach out, he's trying to get them to stop, and they won't. That's why he has to put it to a stop. That's why he has to, he has to, he has to like wipe out nations sometimes because those nations are just so wicked. But that's not what you hear about on TV. Right? You don't hear that side of the story. You just hear, oh, this God of judgment, he's so mean all the time. Why doesn't he just let them do whatever they want? No, it's because when you let man do whatever he wants, he does wicked, right? right? So he says, I'll bring evil. That's, so he's basically saying, hey, he's going to wipe out. I'm going to wipe out all your sons, right? 
and, and your family. You're not going to have a, a lineage anymore because you remember your, your lineage goes through your son. And that's what, the, what God is saying when he's going to wipe out your posterity. You're not going to have a son to carry on your name. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. So if you don't know Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, remember we talked about him already, Baasha was another king. Um, he's about in 1 Kings um, 15 or 16, around there, if I'm going from memory. And he's basically another king that was wicked, that walked in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and people were worshipping false gods and worshipping basically Satan. Uh, and of Jezebel, so there, that's the judgment of Ahab, right? And here's Jezebel's judgment. Of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Right? So these are some pretty specific things. That's why it's so interesting in the Bible. Like God makes these judgments, right? And says, hey, the dogs are going to lick your blood. Where? Naboth's blood. <coughs> Excuse me, my neighbor's blood. And then he says, hey, the dogs are going to eat Jezebel. And he gives a place by the wall, right? <coughs> what do you say? By, the dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. So if you remember, that's where Samaria, the palace, ended, and then Jezreel was there. That's why Naboth's um, vineyard was right next to the palace. <coughs> him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. And him that dieth in the field, shall the fowls of the air eat. Now, what's the significance, right? of somebody dying because of God's judgment, right? Because they were a wicked person and then their, their body being eaten by animals rather than what? A burial, right? Yeah, good. So that's the difference. So he's saying, hey, you're going to get killed and nobody's even going to bury you, right? You're going to get eaten by the animals of the field, the dogs and the fowls of the air. And there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. So here we see the, the motivation of Ahab, right? The motivation of Ahab, you know, he's childish, right? He's greedy, and he allows all this wicked to happen. Why? For money, monetary gain. He wanted the field of Naboth. And he did very abominably in following idols according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. So he hears this judgment from Elijah, right? And what does he do? He humbles himself, right? He rends his clothes. This is something that we don't do today, right? When we're humbling ourselves, we just say, oh, <laughs> just rend our clothes. This is what they used to do back there when they would show their humility. They would just tear their clothing, right? And maybe put sackcloth and ashes on their head. He put sackcloth upon his flesh, fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly, right? So it's not like he really answered back after he heard this judgment. He just sort of humbled himself. And look at this. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? So this is, like, this is where we see the mercy of God, right? Even though this, this king has done such wicked things, right? He humbles himself and God still extends a bit of grace, right? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. So yes, Ahab is still going to die, right? And, his, and the dogs are going to lick up his blood where Naboth was killed. But remember, there were two parts to Ahab's judgment. There was the fact that he was going to die, but there was also that his posterity would be cut off. So what God is referring to here is, hey, because Ahab humbled himself, hey, his posterity, where that's going to happen is after Ahab passes on. And that's what we actually see in the Bible. So here's the judgment of Ahab, right? As we read into 1 Kings 22, where the, the, the judgment that Elijah said to Ahab actually happens. And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. So a lot of time has passed. Three years is a really long time. Right? Maybe Ahab thinks, oh, maybe God's forgotten, right, about what's happened. But no, no, he, he hasn't forgotten um, three years later. It came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. So Jehoshaphat, so you see here, you see, as you read the Bible, you see the king of Judah and you see the king of Israel. So those are the two divided kingdoms, right? So Jehoshaphat is ruling and reigning in Judah, which is Jerusalem, is the capital city. And then at the time, Ahab is the king of Israel. So what happens here? There's some, there's some years where there isn't a war between Israel and Syria, 
right? Judah is separate from Israel at this point. So Israel and Syria are fighting, right? Uh, but for three years, um, there's, there's uh, continue three years without war, right? So there's three years where there's no war. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. So the king of Israel is basically saying, so the king of Judah comes to see him and he says, hey, Ramoth Gilead should belong to us and not to the king of Syria, right? But we haven't gone to take it yet. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, so this is Ahab dialoguing with Jehoshaphat, saying, hey, wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. So this is when Judah and Israel start to sort of come together and be buddies and they're starting to actually work together to do things, right? So what is Jehoshaphat saying to Ahab? Ahab saying, hey, I need to go take this land, Ramoth Gilead, right? It shouldn't belong to the king of Syria. And he's saying to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, hey, you're going to come with me to fight uh, the king of Syria to take this land back. And Jehoshaphat agrees. Jehoshaphat says, hey, yes, my army is going to be like your army. Let's go down and get it. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. So before they go into the battle, Jehoshaphat says, Hey, why don't we ask to the prophets of the Lord, hey, whether we're going to win this battle, right? Verse 6, Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, and shall I forbear? And look at this, And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. So he gathers 400 prophets, right? And says, hey, are we going to win this battle? And all 400 with one voice, right? Say, go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. But see, Jehoshaphat probably senses that something's up, right? Because it's like, how can 400 people all be just agreeing with the same thing? And he says, hey, is there not a prophet of the Lord besides? So I don't know if these 400 prophets are actually prophets of the Lord, of Jehovah. Right? So he's saying, hey, isn't there a prophet of Jehovah? besides these 400 people that we might inquire of him right so joshua knows that something's up he wants something of the lord something is spoken in the name of the lord not just these people telling them what they want to hear and the king of israel said unto joshua there is yet one man now this is often the case and would you know would to god you know in in your circle of influence that you are that one person Right, because here there's 400 people all saying the same thing, all telling the king what he wants to hear. But here in Israel, you know, at the time of Ahab, there's still just only one person. Right? And the minority is generally in the right. Right? There is yet one man, only one prophet is willing to tell the king the truth. Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him. Right? Ahab doesn't like talking about because Micaiah is always telling him what he doesn't want to hear. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. so he's saying, hey, you know, don't say this. Let's, let's listen. Then the king of Israel, to Ahab, called an officer and said, hasten hither Micaiah, the son of Imla. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. So while they're waiting for Micaiah to come, right, to speak in the name of the Lord, the 400 prophets, there are two of them on their thrones, you know, and they're in a void place in the entrance, is like empty where they're sitting, right? And the prophets are all there prophesying. So maybe they're saying different things, and we get a bit of insight into what one of the prophets is saying to them. Zedekiah, the son of che, che, I don't know, Chena, Chenaina, made him horns of iron. And he said, and you think when you have Zedekiah here preaching right to the two kings, kind of reminds you of like these, uh, these Pentecostal preachers, right? They have to have these really elaborate sort of uh, you know, sermon illustrations, right, to make their point. So he makes him just to, just to, to show him how he's going to win this battle. He actually makes horns of iron. Just to, to talk to the king this way. And he says, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. Right? So what is he got? He's got two horns. He's saying, Hey, you know, you're gonna push against the Syrians until you win this battle. That's how you're gonna 
win the battle. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. So you see here, everyone is saying the same thing, right? They're saying what is popular, what they want the king to hear, but not what is the truth. Now we get onto Micaiah. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now the words of the prophet, the words of the prophets, declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. So what is going here? What's going on here? All the prophets 400 are all prophesying the same thing, saying, hey, hey you're going to win this battle. The messenger goes to Micaiah and says, hey, everyone is saying the same thing, right? With one mouth. And he's saying, I'm asking, I pray, please, basically, I pray that I ask of you. Hey, be like the word of one of them and speak that which is good. So there's a bit of pressure here on Micaiah to say, hey, everyone, everyone's saying, you know, what the king wants to hear. You got to be like one of them. See, and in your life as well, you know, when you try and do the right thing, there's always going to be that pressure to conform, isn't it? Pressure at your work to conform like everyone else. If they're not doing things that are ethical, you ought to stand up against that, right? And don't succumb to that pressure to conform. It's the same with amongst your friends. You know, they talk about peer pressure. Peer pressure is a very powerful thing. But don't be like your friends when they're doing evil, right? When they're doing wrong. You need to be like Micaiah and take the stand and not succumb to the pressure of everyone else is doing it. Therefore, I can just conform and I can just get away with, you know, not taking a stand. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So we ought to have that sort of attitude, right? We're going to say whatever's true, right? We're not just going to succumb to peer pressure, political pressure, you know, corporate pressure to do what's wrong and to turn a blind eye to what's going on. So he came to the king and the king said, it, said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we forbear? So now he's asking Micaiah and he answered him, go and prosper for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Now it's interesting because we know here that Micaiah is, is in a sense, he's being sarcastic, right? To come and just say, hey, yeah, well, you know, just go like everyone else is, go and prosper. But Ahab knows it's a little bit different, right? Because he knows Micaiah. He knows that when Micaiah says something, he always says it in the name of the Lord. So he says here, and the king said unto him, how many times shall I adjure thee, right? Shall I request of you that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord. So he knows that Micaiah is not, you know, he's just sort of pulling his leg right now. So he says, hey, I want to know the truth. What, what is actually going to happen? Now Micaiah gives him the truth. And he said, I saw Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. So you'll see that a bit later on as we go into the battle. But basically what Micaiah is saying here is, you're going to die. Right? You're going to die. When you go to the battle, they're not going to have a master. Why are they going to be a sheep scattered? Because in that battle, Ahab will die. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did not I tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? Right? So he's now saying to Jehoshaphat, I told you to say something that I don't want to hear. Right? And he said, Hear thou, so this is now my car again, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. And this is a really interesting uh, you know, prophecy that he gives here because it gives us a bit of insight into what happens in heaven. Right? He says, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. Right? So he sees God sitting on the throne. And all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? So the Lord is, stand, is sitting in heaven on his throne. You've got the host of heaven there. And then you've got the, the people, uh, sorry, all the, all the, I guess all the, uh, the heavenly creatures that are in heaven as well. And he's, saying, uh, he's asking them, hey, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner and another said on that manner. And there came forth the spirit and stood before the Lord and said, 
I will persuade him. So a spirit steps forward and says, hey, I'm going to persuade Ahab. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? Right? So how are you going to do it? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. So this is what is interesting, right? Because the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. Right? So God does not lie. But what's interesting in this scenario, he's saying, hey, who's going to persuade Ahab? And then a spirit steps forward, right? And says, hey, I'm going to go and be a lying spirit in Ahab's mouth. And God says, hey, go and do it. Right? He allows that spirit to carry out what that spirit decided to do, right? So what it gives us some insight into is how Satan operates, right? People often ask the question, you know, why does God allow Satan to do what he does? You know, why is Satan even still allowed to do what he does? Why? Because God uh, allows these things because he can use these wicked spirits. He can use these lying spirits, spirits like, you know, like creatures like Satan as well to fulfill judgment, right? On the earth of people that are not walking in the right ways of God, like with Ahab. So now therefore behold the Lord. So now Micaiah is talking here. Behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. And the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee, but Zedekiah, so this is, the, this is the prophet that had the horns, right? Saying, hey, you're going to push the king, king of Syria until you've consumed them. The son of Chena, Chena, I've got to figure out how to say it, Chenaena, Chenaena, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, which way went the spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? So what does Zedekiah say? He comes and smacks Micaiah across the face and says, did the Lord also tell me basically to, to smack you across the face? He says, which way went the spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. So he's saying, hey, you'll see it come to pass because when it comes to pass, you're going to be hiding in your house because now, you've, now it's going to be revealed that you spoke lies to the king. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Amon the governor of the city and to Joash the king's son. And say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison, feed him with bread of affliction and with water of affliction until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, O people, every one of you. I just love the boldness of Micaiah. I mean, he's not willing to take a stand. He's not willing to be the only one to say the truth, right? And he, and he had to pay for it, right? He, he paid a price of actually suffering physical persecution for being willing to say, hey, whatever the Lord's going to say, that's what I'm going to say. And even when he says, he's, he's confident, obviously, because he knows this is what the Lord of the Word is. And he says, hey, if thou return at all in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. So he's saying, hey, if you go out to battle and you come back in peace, then you can label me as a false prophet, basically. The Lord has not spoken by me. But then he says, hearken, listen, O people, every one of you. So the king of Israel, Josaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. So they decide not to listen to Micaiah, right? Not to, to heed his call, not go to battle. They decide to go anyway. But what is interesting, um, we already talked about the application of Micaiah, what is interesting in this story in 1 Kings 22 and verse 30, it says here, And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, so they go up to battle at Ramoth Gilead against the king of Israel, right? But the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. Now this is interesting that it seemed like, probably from Micaiah's point of view, when he preached against the king and said, hey, you're basically going to die in battle, and if you don't die in battle, then I'm a false prophet, right? You better listen to what I'm saying. That they went up anyway. So from Micaiah's point of view, he probably thought, oh, these people are not even paying attention to what I'm saying, right? You know, he's going, he's going into the prison, and he's being fed with water of affliction and, and bread of affliction. But this is where, you know, this ought to encourage you, that sometimes when you're preaching to somebody and you're telling them the gospel, that even though on the outside... They're very strong, right? And they think, oh, you know, yeah, that's silly or whatever. But even King Ahab, he took that to heart, right? Because if he wasn't listening to Micaiah at all, do you think he would have disguised himself? Right? No. 
Because if he thought if he thought like Micaiah, like no, not a grain of salt, didn't care what he said, he said, I'll just go to the battle and just wear my robes like I always do. But no, the reason why he disguised himself, because he's trying to think, hey, I need to go to battle. I want to go against God's word. But I'm thinking, can I, can I kind of escape God's judgment? Right? I don't want to die in the battle, so I'm going to disguise myself and hopefully they don't recognize me. Verse 31, but the king of Syria... And I'll probably just get through this chapter and then we'll finish. I had another chapter, but there's no way I'm going to get to it. By the king of, but the king of Syria commanded his 30 and two captains that had rule over his chariots, saying, Fight neither with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. So this is, this is another reason why he's trying to disguise himself, right? Oh, I guess he doesn't know this, right? But what's, what's interesting is that the king of Syria is saying, here in verse 31, he's saying, when you go to battle with Israel and Judah, He's saying, I don't want you to try and fight against Judah. I don't want you to fight against the people of Israel. I want you to try and find the king of Israel and fight against him. That's the, that's the, 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 the direction that he's given to his 32 captains, right? Fight neither with small or great, save only with the king of Israel, right? So he's, he actually is after the king of Israel. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat, remember, was the king of Judah, that they said, surely it is the king of Israel. So they see Jehoshaphat, right? Because Jehoshaphat's still wearing his kingly robes. And they're saying, surely that is um, Ahab. And they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. So here's the picture, right? Remember? So he's, he's Jehoshaphat's in his robe. Uh, Ahab is disguised himself because he doesn't want to die in this battle. King of Syria saying, hey, go after the king of Israel, not with anybody else, go after him. So they go after the king of Judah, thinking that it's the king of Israel. But then Jehoshaphat cries out, and then they realize, hey, wait, that's not Ahab, that's actually Jehoshaphat. So they turn aside, right? And they, they, now they don't know where, where um, Ahab is. But look at what happens in verse 34. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture. What does that mean? It just means just a random arrow just gets fired right into the battle. Right? This random arrow at a venture. And smote the king of Israel. This is, this is Ahab, right? He's trying to disguise himself. He's trying not to die in this battle. Smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Right? So because they're wearing armor, this random bow, this, this random arrow that comes flying out of nowhere hits Ahab and hits him between the harness, like, you know, where the, where the joints are, right? So it hits him actually in his body. And he says, wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, so he's in his chariot, right? And he's got the person driving the chariot. He says, turn thine hand. What does turn thine hand mean? Like, turn around, turn thine hand. Carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. Right? So he's, now he's trying to flee from the battle. But look what happens in verse 35. And the battle increased that day, right? And the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even. So not only does he try and disguise himself, this random arrow comes out of nowhere, right? Shoots him in, in, between the harness. So now he's bleeding. He tells his driver, hey, get out of the battle. I'm wounded. But because the battle now is increasing, the chariot can't get out of the battle. So he's left there to bleed out and dies in his chariot. Right, so this is God. This is God here in this situation, making sure that judgment is carried out. Right now, God doesn't control everything. Right, we're not Calvinists, we're not hyper Calvinists, but God can carry things out if He wants them to happen a certain way. Right, uh, against the Syrians, died at even, and the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. And there went a proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying, "Every man to his city." Every man to his own country. Remember the prophecy of um, Micaiah saying, I saw the people as sheep scattered, you know, said, return every man to his country. So the king died, look at this, and was brought to Samaria and they buried the king in Samaria. And one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria and the dogs licked up his blood. So that's how the prophecy was carried out. He died in battle. His blood ran out into his chariot but the way the dogs lift up his blood is because when they took the chariot back to Samaria, the guy that washed it, washed it where Naboth was killed. And that's how his blood was licked up by the dogs, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake. Now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did and the ivory house which he made and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book 
of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. So Ahab slept with his fathers, and Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. So that's where the story ends for Ahab, because that's where he dies. I won't go into, I wanted to talk, maybe I'll do this next week, but I'll go into the story of the judgment of Jezebel, right? The judgment of Jezebel is the second part of what Elijah was talking about, right? The second part where Jezebel is going to be, get eaten by the dogs. And that's an interesting story as well. So maybe I can go into that one in a bit more depth. Um, and that's in, in uh, 2 Kings 9. But what's some things we can learn? You know, ho hopefully that story was interesting to you. And as you read through your Bible again and you get to that story, that's going to come more alive to you when you read through 1 Kings 21 and 1 Kings 22. But what are some things we can learn? We already learned a bit about, hey, taking a stand for God, not selling yourself out, right? Like Ahab sold himself out, you know, Naboth. He wasn't willing to sell himself out, to give away the inheritance of his fathers. And same with Micaiah. If you think about it, Micaiah was not willing to succumb to the peer pressure. He was willing to take a stand for God and suffer the persecution that came with it. So that's one thing I want you to take away from the sermon. The second thing I want you to take away from it as well, I'll just share a few verses uh, with you. Um, I'll just jump down because here, I just wanted to show you this uh, passage here in Romans. But one thing we can take comfort in the story of Naboth. Like I said at the beginning, Naboth, he was like a nobody. I mean, who was he, right? He wasn't like a noble or anything. Remember all the nobles and the elders in his city? Those were the ones that conspired against him to, to raise up the false prophets and kill him. So he was like a noble. He was just a guy that had a parcel of land, a vineyard that the king wanted, but he decided to take a stand. And I'm sure in that day when Naboth was killed, right, Naboth was probably thinking like, hey, who's going to plead my cause? Right, like, you know, because he just took a stand, he was falsely accused, he was stoned to death, he probably died thinking, hey, you know what, their life is going to carry on, you know, he's going to heaven now, and maybe thought nothing of it. And sometimes we think about that in our life, like we're wronged, or somebody does wrong to us, and we think the Lord doesn't see these things. And I think the story of Naboth teaches us that the Lord actually takes a personal interest in the lives of his children, right, where he will right those wrongs. And you know, maybe it doesn't always happen in this life. In this story, it happens in this life. But God sees all the wrongs that are committed. And we ought to take you know, sort of a, a encouragement from Naboth's story to know that we don't have to take necessarily vengeance into our own hands, right? Because God saw to it, right, that Naboth's vineyard was avenged, right? Ahab even tried to run away from God's judge, tried to disguise himself, but God made sure it happened. Uh, according to the prophecy that Elijah said to um, Ahab. So we'll just finish here on Romans 12. Romans 12 says here, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. So the Bible's saying here, hey, we, we don't have to worry about getting revenge, getting even. That's not our main concern. What we ought to focus on is just doing right. Right? If we've been wronged by people, you know, we've been wronged by family, wronged by friends, wronged maybe by business partners, wronged by your company for doing what's right, right? Not doing what's wrong. You know, there's no glory in that if you do wrong and you get in trouble. But for doing what's right, you don't need to worry about getting revenge. You just need to focus on doing right, taking that stand like Naboth did. Just take the stand for the inheritance that he had. You give place unto wrath. Where is that place? For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, see this is us focusing on doing what's right. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So this is a principle in the New Testament that we just focus on doing what's right. right? We don't have to go out and seek vengeance. And I think the story of Naboth the Jezreelite is a reminder of that, that God takes personal interest in the lives of his children. He made sure that Naboth was avenged. You know, Naboth obviously was killed, but you know, there are other people that may be seeking vengeance as well. Um, but we can leave, sometimes leave those things to the Lord and just focus on doing what is right. Right. All right. So we'll continue with the story of Jezebel next week because I think that's a really interesting chapter too. And I want to show you some of the things that happened in 2 Kings 9. Um, but we'll continue that next week. All right. Let's pray. All right. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, thank you for the story of Naboth, um, an encouragement to us, Lord. And help us, you know, as Romans 12 teaches us, 
to give place unto wrath, that we don't avenge ourselves. We just focus, Lord, on doing what's right. And that doesn't mean, Lord, that we forsake justice and judgment. There's still a place for those things, Lord, that, that, that the government is there to punish people. But when the government itself is wicked, Lord, and there is no justice in the land, uh, Lord, help us just to continue to focus on doing what is right. So thank you, Lord, for the example of Naboth, the example of Micaiah from the Bible. I pray, Lord, that we can learn some things from these examples. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.